Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Nine South South Forum on Sustainability. The theme is the collapse of modern civilization and the future of humanity. My name is Sitroy Jadi Margaret, a founding member of Global University for Sustainability. Today we have a panel on the review of the course of African people's struggles for liberation, which has started from 8th of March in this year as well as to introduce a new series about African thinkers. The course is co-organized by Global University for Sustainability, Lingnan University, Daladra Press, Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives, and the Green Guan Echo Tech Center. We provide English, French, Chinese, and Spanish simultaneous interpretation. You can find a group icon of interpretation at the bottom of your computer screen. We would like to thank today's interpreters, uh, English French interpreters, Maria de Brasier and Umit Hersen, English Chinese interpreters, Huang Xiaomei and Li Monghong, Chinese Spanish interpreters, uh, Fang Tong uh, Chen, Liu Tianyu, Ling Zhou Yang, Zhao Yajie, Apart from Zoom webinar, we also do live streaming on Bilibili, which is a very popular social media platform in China. There are thousands of young followers who are interested in world politics and eager to learn alternative thoughts and experience. Let me introduce the speakers. Dr. Philo Manjis is the course director of African Actual Series. He is a young professor in the Institute of African Studies at Carleton University in Canada. He is also the director of Daladra Press, a publisher that nurtures reflection, shelters hope, and inspires audacity. Michael New Cosmos is emeritus professor in humanities, Ross uh, University in South Africa. He is also research fellow of uh, Stanley Bosch Institute of Advanced Studies in, Af in South Africa. He spoke Thinking Freedom in Africa toward a theory of emancipatory politics, which is published by Wyss University Press in 2016, which is uh, awarded the France uh, Fanon Award for Outstanding Book in Caribbean Thought by the, uh, by the Caribbean uh, Philosophical Association. Thank you very much. And I uh, pass the floor to uh, Philos. Thank you. Jada and Kichi, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and um, thank you to all the amazing interpreters. Uh, what energy and uh, um, quality you provide. So thank you very much for, for what you're doing. Um, my task here is really uh, it's quite a difficult one and that's to uh, perhaps review and, and provide uh, some reflections on the lectures that uh, have been given since the uh, beginning of March. Um, I, I do this with some hesitation as there was such richness, breadth and depth to all the contributions and, and any summary cannot do uh, justice to all these contributions. Uh, it's therefore, um, you know, inevitably a very personal inter interpretation, and also given the time, uh, the the limit to which how much I can uh, cover on all of that. Um, I've tried to cluster some of the the, the um, presentations on in in some kind of uh, um, under headings uh, rather than just in the order in which. Uh, the presenter spoke, and there were lots of overlaps between what people had to uh, to say in their talks. I mean, I think the the, the context, first of all, is 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 the the fact that you know um, that that the civilizations of of uh, of Africa um, that had emerged and uh, over thousands of years and which um, had uh, a richness 
uh, parallel to any what people keep often referring to China as a, as a place where um, huge civilizations established, but that was the same case in 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 Africa and indeed. Um, Europe at that time was was essentially a tribal uh, region with many, many conflicts. And we had uh, um, Professor uh, Yoforeka Somet talk about some of these ancient African uh, civilizations. And he gave a remarkable overview of these, these uh, civilizations uh, in, in, on the African continent and what today we would perhaps refer to as West Asia. Uh, but dating back many, several thousand years. Um, you know, he, he pointed out how the, the migrations that occurred from, uh, from Africa to the many uh, continents uh, and islands uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the globe. Um, and as I said, you know, many of these civilizations were well in advance of those found elsewhere and, and included um, major empires like Ghana, Mali, Mossi, Songhai, Zimbabwe, and many, many more. Um, he introduced us to the development of writing, mathematics, science, technology, art, and culture. Um, again, uh, uh, really uh, in giving us a, a perspective on what um, that, you know, uh, people like Hegel claim that uh, Africa had no history. Um, and uh, I think this uh, presentation quite put pay to that. I think the thing that was uh, striking for me as sort of one, one major takeaway is that, you know, before the period of enslavement and the, and the emergence of the European slave trade and before the advent of colonialism, uh, around 1600 uh, in the current era, the, the population of the continent was estimated to be around 800 million souls. And by 1960, the period of national independence, the population of the continent had been decimated to below its size in the year uh, 800 in the current era uh, people. And uh, this is, you know, uh, it was a, a systematic attempt to destroy, uh, uh, it was parallel with the systematic attempt to destroy uh, all the evidence of the vast cities and civilizations that had been uh, been established. Uh, and, and it was a period in which there was a long history of, of emancipatory thinking uh, that was evident in that uh, period, uh, which Michael Neocosmos, I'm sure, will, will be referring to uh, on, uh, in his presentation uh, after this. So, you know, this decimation of this population. So what, what happened? Um, Richard Pithouse took us through a history which is uh, described in a small pamphlet called Being Human After 1492. Having succeeded in, in establishing one of the most advanced civilizations in the Iberian Peninsula that lasted 700 years, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, a few lords, in the, in the region that subsequently became known as Spain, uh, managed with the support of Italian financiers and the Vatican uh, to overthrow the empire in 1492, beginning in Europe, the period of torture, terror, elimination of Muslim Jewish population that had lived there for, for, for centuries. Uh, it was the same year that, of course, that, that they sponsored the, the Portuguese sailor Christoph Columbus to, to accidentally discover the Caribbean and what then became known as the American continent. Uh, that began with the blessing of the Vatican and the establishment of the doctrine of discovery, uh, which declared that the Americas had uh, the terra, terra nullius that had no uh, humans uh, there and therefore 
the genocide of the peoples of, of the Americas. Uh, and similarly, the same doctrine enabled the, the capture of uh, and justification for the capture of slaves uh, from peoples from Africa, the destruction of their societies, their shipping across the Atlantic, and their condemnation uh, to chattel slavery, that is, treated as cattle whose descendants were to be born forever slaves. This was the beginning of the fortunes made by, by Europe through the exploitation of slave labor. As some of you may have read from Howard French's uh, book, Born in Blackness, the life expectancy of slaves working in the sugar industrial concentration camps was around five years. So the need to replenish those who died was to become, uh, become for some 200 year or more years, a, a central feature of the Atlantic slave trade, replacing all those who had died in those horrific conditions uh, of uh, industrial uh, um, plantations. So those who found themselves in these sugar plantations were not merely slave labor, but recently arrived people from Africa who brought with them memories of their culture, history, and the military and political experience. It was no surprise that there were many attempts to overthrow slavery and the formation of maroon colonies or runaway slaves. Uh, but the most important uh, one was the successful revolution to overthrow slavery uh, uh, were by people who were recently transported from, from West Africa on the island of San Domingue and the establishment of the Republic of, of Haiti. Th this revolution was to take the democratic proclamations of the French Revolution to another level in declaring all people are humans. It would be remembered that the, the slaves defeated the Spanish, the French, the British, the French again, creating a major crisis for Napoleon, uh, resulting in France having to sell uh, it, their, their colonies in, in North America uh, and uh, the whole uh, region of Louisiana, uh, which was to uh, contribute to the actual formation of, uh, uh, of the USA. Um, and it was uh, critical, uh, critically, it was, it continues to be uh, African labor that accounts for the accumulation of capital and what uh, Howard French talks about as the emergence of uh, Western modernity. In my own presentation, I, I, I tried to address this thorny question of what does it mean to be African? And I drew on the, on the writings of Amilcar Cabral and Franz Fanon and others to point out that the term African was an invention of Europe, a shorthand for those considered not human or less than human. It's important to recognize that, that the peoples of, of Africa did at that time did not call themselves African. They were, uh, they were associated with uh, either, either the small uh, territories which they defined or in, in terms of the empires in which they lived. Uh, and so the concept of Africa as such uh, wasn't something that was uh, from, from Africa. It was something that, that Europe invented uh, and uh, was used as a derogatory term. African was a derogatory term uh, that essentially uh, was a shorthand for the non-human as declared by, by, by the uh, uh, doctrine of discovery, and that justified enslavement and, and the rendering of the people of the continent to chattel slavery and subsequently to colonialism. But the term, like many of uh, terms that are, that are uh, invented uh, as uh, derogatory terms, uh, was actually appropriated by the anti-colonial movements uh, in, especially in the post Second World War period, uh, to to represent the, the uh, and organizing for freedom, justice, dignity, and human emancipation. Almost every single uh, uh, political party across the continent in the in the anti colonial movement had the word African uh, as part of uh, the name of their party, and I think that's a really important point because Africa then became 
connected to the idea of freedom. It was, it, it had an emancipatory ring to it, to be proud to be Af African. Um, sadly, uh, after uh, independence and the rise of the new colonial uh, uh, regime, the, the, the new elite systematically uh, unlinked the term African from its emancipatory associations. Uh, and uh, they fundamentally essentially occupied the colonial state without transforming it or democratizing it. And the result was that, that African became detached, the term African became detached from any emancipatory uh, um, association uh, and, and has, has gradually become purely a taxonomic term uh, and, and uh, the resulting degeneration of, of politics into ethnicism and tribalism. I argue in that, in that presentation that it's not possible to understand or even recognize African people's humanity without taking account of their long history of struggles for emancipation. It's so sad to see that so much of uh, literature about uh, freedom, about emancipation, uh, um, ignores the, 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 the struggles uh, of African peoples and as if they have only to learn from the West rather than the West learning from the heroic struggles of other peoples. And that it is only possible, I suggest, if the politics of African histories are understood and transcended to reveal their fundamental contributions to the universal human condition. Experience that, uh, experiences that, as Cabral put it, belong to the whole world. Let me turn then to the, to the cluster of uh, presentations that dealt with uh, the liberation struggles. Um, uh, Professor Michele Gitai Murgo spoke about uh, African women in the liberation uh, struggle and, and the spirit of Utu and uh, Ubuntu. Uh, central to Michele's presentation was the outlining of that philosophy of Utu Ubuntu. Uh, and she, as she put it, the heart of my argument is that knowledge and scholarship can either be colonizing, alienating and enslaving, or alternatively, they can be conscientizing, humanizing and liberating, creating new human beings with the agency to transform the world for the better. I mean, much of African history is, is, uh, is written frequently with the silence uh, of the role of, uh, of women in the, in, the, in the struggle for freedom. And I think it was important uh, how uh, Professor Mogo uh, spoke about uh, women who have been part of those liberation struggles, including personalities such as Ya Asatewa, uh, who was an influential queen from amongst the Ashanti people of Ghana at the beginning of the 20th century. Mbuya Nehanda was the famous Shona spirit medium who lived in Chidamba village on the hills around Mazoe near Harare, Zimbabwe. From 1913 to 1914, uh, Meka uh, 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 Wamenza, a woman priest, priestess at the uh, Kaya Fongo, a religious sanctuary and also political headquarters of the Giriyama people on Kenya's co uh, coast, led an armed struggle known as the Giriyama uprising against the British colonial government. And there are many other examples, the Arbor women's uh, uh, riots of the 1929 South Eastern Nigeria, the Abekuta women's revolt, which took place in Yoruba land, Nigeria between 1947 and 1948, and which was com uh, uh, commemorated by Wally Soinka uh, in Ake, the years of childhood, where it referred to the great upheaval. They played a central role in the struggle to end apartheid under the banner of the Federation of South African Women, and up to 20,000 women burnt passes that 
a day that is now historical, historically commemorated as the National Women's Day in South Africa. Yeah. She spoke about the women who fought in the liberation wars of, uh, with Fralimo in Mozambique, PAIGC in, in Guinea-Bissau, the party for independence of Guinea-Bissau and Cap Verde, and in the Algerian uh, revolution. She also drew attention to uh, Field Marshal Muthoniwa Kirima, uh, who was a leading fighter uh, in the struggle for Kenya Land and Freedom Army, the, the movement that the British label as the Mau Mau. Professor Issa Shivji help provide some critical re uh, reflections on uh, Pan-African thought, um, providing a really rich historical overview of the, the rise of, of Pan-Africanism, um, and, and pointed out that this was a perspective that was, that was founded in, in, in the USA and Caribbean by people such as Henry Sylvester William, Williams, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, C.L.R. James, and others. The movement was fundamentally anti-racist. Um, and there were contentions with uh, people like Marcus Garvey, who was calling for, for a, a return of, uh, of the African people to, to Africa and the establishment of, a, of an empire, an African empire to match uh, those of, uh, of Europe. It, it was a, a clearly a, a, a dream that could not be fulfilled for, uh, for that to happen, to, be, to match uh, the Europeans, they would have had to, uh, um, well, would have had to uh, destroy and, and enslave uh, vast sectors of, of humanity uh, across Europe and Asia uh, to make that possible. And, uh, it was a view that was strongly challenged by Du Bois. The, the turning point uh, in the Pan-African movement comes at, with the fifth uh, Pan-African Congress, which was held in Manchester in 1945, uh, where uh, the secretariat was, was uh, chaired by, co-chaired by uh, Jomo Kenyatta and, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and where the, the demands for national liberation, African uni unity, and social democratic rights were powerfully expressed. Um, so Shivji spoke about the dilemmas and contradictions of the debates between the projects of Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere. The Kwame Nkrumah saying, you know, we must uh, unite the whole continent now, uh, and Nyerere being more, more hesitant. Uh, about that, but this was the founding, the the the, the, the movement that that defined a uh, a potential national project, which was the 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 drive for uh, for for independence, um, which eventually degenerated into uh, into uh, nationalism. The distinction between these these idea of the national project and nationalism being that the national project was an inclusive uh, emancipated at least a uh, even perhaps a uh, advancing uh, that uh, a, a social uh, um, um, uh, agenda whereas nationalism is an exclusivist uh, pro project uh, which defines itself of not being others um, and, and uh, so uh, uh, as I spoke about the extent to which there remains an agenda for social emancipation. And if that does exist, then it has to come from, from below. It can no longer be uh, a project of the African elite as expressed in, in the African Union or the former, uh, uh, formerly the uh, Organization for African Unity. And, and he points out that social emancipation and national liberation, gender liberation, have all these have to be part of it and it must be fundamentally anti-imperialist. And he says a socialist vision is, is central to any concept of Pan-Africanism. One of the things that, that emerged uh, in the sort of independence period uh, and, and the sort of polarization 
uh, around the Cold War with the U between the USA and 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 uh, the um, and, uh, USA China and uh, um, uh, the USSR um, was was the the emergence of of the Bandung uh, conference and uh, and and the anti colonial movements across what was then called the Third World um, and. You know, in the face of the Cold War, uh, nationalist leaders set up the and established the, the Bandung Conference and the, and the Northern Alliance Movement. Uh, but one of the important outcomes of uh, of that was the the establishment of something that people have, I think, often forgotten, and was the establishment of of a very dynamic Afro Asian writers movement that published uh, uh, the magazine Lotus. Uh, um, and uh, which, in which uh, virtually all the sort of leading uh, thinkers uh, and, and writers of the liberation movement uh, uh, contributed poetry and other literary works to. Uh, and it became a, a, a really dynamic uh, magazine, but was then subsequently uh, split uh, as a result of the gro growing differences between uh, China and and USSR, and and a, and a, and a new uh, um, magazine uh, parallel uh, was uh, the, the Call, which was established um, in uh, uh, in very fundamentally influenced by by the followers of Mao uh, and. Uh, the, and had a base in, in China as well. Uh, um, and Tariq uh, Mehmood spoke, spoke about the, the materials that were published in both magazines. And it's wonderful. I think it's a lovely reflection of the fact that it is the Global University of Sustainability based in China uh, that has made uh, possible this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this series of talks on African liberation and other uh, example of Afro-Asian connection. Um, the next cluster of, of, of presentations was, was uh, um, around neo-colonialism and extractivism. Um, you know, while formal independence, whatever, whatever that might, might, might argue that was, uh, was established across much of Africa, the reality is that a new form of colonialism, neo-colonialism, was established that ensured the continuation of the exploitation of African, African people and the looting of their resources by USA, Europe, and Japan, and, uh, what Samir Amin uh, refers to as the triad. Uh, Dongo Sabasila and Fanny Pijo uh, made a very interesting uh, presentation on monetary imperialism. Um, the case of the CFR in West Africa. Uh, what a striking example of how France controlled the currencies and economies of the West and Central African uh, former colonies was through a powerful use of control over, over currencies and effectively ensuring that those countries remain controlled economically and therefore politically too, uh, to become uh, a new version of, of color, of, of, of the form of colonialism. Um, and they spoke very eloquently about the way in which control was exercised based on, uh, on an excellent book on that very topic. Um, and while, while what they spoke about was specific to the West and Central African former French colonies, the reality it gives an, an insight into the fact that internationally the US dollar plays exactly the same role of uh, controlling them. All debt has to be paid in, in dollars. All international uh, trade has to be carried out in, in dollars. Um, and that has been true ever since the delinking of the, uh, of the dollar from the gold standard in the 1970s. Uh, and, and, it, and, and that has played a, a similar role uh, to the CFR, uh, enabling the process of underdevelopment about which Walter Rodney has uh, spoken many, much in his book, uh, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. 
Yao Graham spoke about the uh, minerals and Africa's uh, development, the struggle over discourses, policies, and practices. Uh, Yao is, uh, um, leads the uh, Third World Africa Network. He spoke of the rapacious nature of the natural resource extraction of, of transnational corporations and the ineffectual policies that African governments have had in relation to that, partly because of their collusion and vested interest in allying with these corporations. He pointed out that over the past two decades, popular struggles have contributed to shifting the discourse in the area of minerals and development, uh, but there is a constant uh, contention uh, of, over that. And the hegemony of the raw material export model, uh, which uh, has, uh, he argues, been undermined even within uh, the African elite. A similar issue was raised by, by Nimo Basi in his description of uh, cooking a continent, environment, climate change, and resource extraction. The connection between natural resource extraction and environmental damage, damage including the poisoning of water tables and the, and the ground and the earth by transnational, transnational was highlighted by him. Uh, but something that is fairly widely recognized, but I think it's only recently, and I think it's much of a tribute to Nimmo's writings, uh, that, uh, the, that uh, he has shown the, the, the direct relationship between climate chaos uh, as a result of extractivism, not only of mineral resource extraction, but of, uh, of but also extractivism of uh, industrial agriculture, a form of extraction that is dependent on fertilizers and poisonous uh, materials uh, uh, used to to try to keep pests uh, away. Keep the coal in the hole, the oil in the sand, said Nimmo. Another aspect of uh, of neocolonialism. Uh, was provided by Sama al-Baluchi -Bul uh, and Brittany Mashi, uh, who, who spoke about the militarization and suppression of popular movements uh, across Africa. And uh, the US, um, they showed, has an unrivaled network of military bases around the world, around roughly around 800 uh, such bases. While these, mili are, uh, these military bases are often are presented uh, to the American public as, as defensive infrastructures, in reality, they are offensive structures that constitute a key component of uh, US power projection. And AFRICOM, uh, which was established in 2007 under the Bush administration and became fully operational in 2008 under, under Obama, uh, covers the, the African continent with the exception of Egypt and is designed to extend and protect US political and economic interests in the region. Today, AFRICOM has roughly 29 known military facilities in 15 countries, uh, but that uh, figure excludes the, the collusion and collaboration of, uh, of the military uh, um, uh, in, across Africa with, with the US. Um, they, they state militarization is intimately connected not only to the obvious increase in the size of armies and research into militant nationalism and militant fundamentalism, but also to the less visible deformation of human uh, potentials into the hierarchies of race, gender, and sexuality and to the shaping of the national histories in ways that glorify and legitimate military action. And they spoke uh, quite substantially about uh, the details of uh, uh, militarization by the US in Sudan, Ethiopia, Somali, Kenya, and across the Sahel. But of course, uh, it's not as if those whom Fanon called les damnés de la terre, the wretched of the earth, uh, it's not as if they remain silent in the face of uh, militarization, exploitation, uh, and uh, um, um, 
and and uh, and attacks um, and and we were very very proud to have uh, Spuru Zikode uh, uh, to talk about the struggle of Al Khali Bas uh, Basmo Jandolo, uh, the South African chateau and the this is the, the largest movement of shack dwellers in Africa, comprising more than 100,000 members across South Africa. When Abu Khali questions democracy, freedom, and humanity, it is also a, a practice. In other words, it's not merely statements. Uh, and and they, they see their mandate and task uh, uh, of the membership is to humanize the world, as he puts it. Uh, Abu Salih have been in the lead against the culture of xenophobia, or more accurately should be called racism against Africa and other people perceived as being outsiders. Abu Salih has been pathologized, depicted as other, uh, as the other, uh, and being less than or, or not uh, part of civilized humanity. Um, what uh, uh, Michael Neocosmos goes on to refer to as uncivil society. Abashlali's own history and revolt has constantly faced the accusation that its politics are irrational because it doesn't understand the complex complexities of so-called development. How could people who were living in shacks think that was the big question? And the central question is something that Michael will, uh, I know, discuss shortly. Um, and that is the, the centrality or the importance of recognition uh, that uh, the wretched of the earth think and have a capacity for emancipatory uh, thought. Another perspective from the informal set settlers came from Kenya uh, with uh, Gasheke uh, Gashihi, Gataga Ndongo, and Marianne Kasina. They spoke of the of state responses to, to popular struggles in Kenya's informal urban settlements, emphasizing, uh, like the, the experience of Abu Khali, in how the state seeks systematically to eliminate protests uh, from, from those considered disposable. Um, and the, the COVID pandemic illustrated uh, very well how uh, different uh, um, perspectives were, were, were provided for those from the middle class homes and characterized by the, the statement that the middle class uh, in the COVID uh, pandemic were pierced by needles, whereas those in the informal settlements are, are pierced by bullets. Uh, one of Anchor and uh, Manjane uh, also addressed the question of, uh, of the wretched of the earth in, in, the, in the struggle of land and liberation, the rural agency and peasant struggles in the past and present. Um, and point out that the agrarian extractive capital has been the most penetrating in the countryside, causing land conflicts, displacement of local peasant communities, and in worst cases, uh, uh, deaths. The peasantry and rural people in general have just not been uh, merely passive uh, in this process. They show how uh, he showed in his, in his book, uh, how uh, alone or in alliance with non-governmental organizations and activists, they have positioned themselves strongly against such dynamics and have raised their voices questioning developmentalist logics that are imposed on them but that are that they take away that take away their means of production and violate their rights. In fact, the resistant movement to capital that they are, they are undertaking uh, throughout the, the region, uh, even in response to the to the repression by the state, these resistances are they are the fundamental to democratize democracies. Hamza Hamoshen and um, Muzan Al Neil spoke about the popular uh, uh, uprising in, in 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 North Africa recently. Uh, Ten years ago, the so-called Arab uh, 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 Spring, the uprisings, were celebrated as world-changing events. The emancipatory experience was so contagious that people were inspired all over the world. Um, occupiers from London to Wall Street and the Indignados 
or proud to walk like an Egyptian. The revolutionary process that has swept North Africa and West Asia, driven by demands for bread, freedom, dignity, and social justice, they argued has seen ups and downs, gains and setbacks, which materialized in the liberal democratic transition in Tunisia and bloody counter-revolutions and imperialist interventions in other countries, including Egypt, Libya, and so on. And I think this is a, a, a salutary lesson to, to recognize that revolutions are not linear processes, but will go through up, uh, ups and downs. And I think what we are seeing uh, happening across the region uh, is in a sense, uh, perhaps uh, act one, scene two uh, of a much longer uh, play. Uh, and, and, and this has led some pundits to pronounce the death sentence on the so-called Arab Spring. And a decade on, this protracted revolutionary process is well into the second wave of revolt, triggered by the same features of governance political economy that shaped the first wave, they argue. This time it started from Sudan in December 2018 and then spread to Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, and so on. 2019 saw massive popular movements erupting into the political stage, demanding radical change and achieving uh, some uh, degree of historical gains. Mozan al Neil gave a brief history of the Sudanese revolution between 2018, December and mid to 2020, describing the conditions that triggered and sustained the protests at the, at the face of, uh, in the face of uh, state violence the evolution of, of protest tools and the resistance from the counter-revolutionary nature of the transitional uh, government in 2019 to 2021, the structure and policies, the, the popular, but they're also the popular rejection of the October 25th coup and the events that led to adoption of the three no's, no negotiation, no partnership, no legitimacy. Um, and it's really important, I think, to recognize that, that uh, how powerfully this movement was, uh, was led by, uh, by, by women. Uh, and, and similar uh, presentation was made by Saleh, uh, Saleh Mome, uh, uh, a mom on, uh, on the popular resistance uh, on, uh, against the armed forces. So then we come to this idea of thinking freedom. Uh, Michael Neo Cosmos, in his uh, uh, presentation, uh, which was an extensive and, and fascinating one, points out that after all the sacrifices that African people have made over many years to free themselves from oppression of slavery and colonialism, the reality is, you know, we have to admit that we've not reached freedom or Uhuru. Uh, and to, to really understand why that happened, it's important that he argues that uh, we need to analyze and understand the nature of the state and the new forms of oppression on the one hand, and what he calls the idioms of popular struggles of resistance to it on the other. Uh, he feels that uh, what is central to any thinking of human emancipation and equality is a relationship between people on the one hand and organized power, namely the state on the other. The relation between the two has always been contentious and because the state resulted from and established itself uh, and enabled the growth of a large inequalities between people, between the wealthy who control state power and those who were dominated by it, uh, the producers uh, of the means of life. Today, he argues, the state in Africa is without doubt a capitalist neo-colonial state. There are times in history, he argues, exceptional times to be sure, when popular resistance has exceeded the parameters of identities of social movements, and when it has proposed an idea of universal humanity, when its resistance has been oriented toward the emancipation of a broad section of the population and even towards the emancipation of humanity as a whole, and not simply to defending the interests of a single community. He reviewed some of the historical events, uh, evidence of such movements in Africa, and I'm sure he will speak to 
that out more in the next uh, section of this session. He highlighted how the neo-colonial state is founded on the idea of a large proportion of the, of the population, often the majority, uh, who are to be ruled as if they, are, they were the enemy or potential enemy. He contrasted the nature of the state-oriented sanction civil society with uncivil society, the former having access to rights, the, uh, the latter denied those, but organized to claim their right to be human and as, as human, capable of thinking. And then the penultimate session uh, also dealt with the issue of, of, of uh, freedom, and liberation uh, and the thinking of uh, Franz Fanon in a uh, section entitled Fanon Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, uh, which uh, we had Nigel Gibson to send last year, uh, Samar Jabbar from uh, Palestine and uh, Lou Turner. And we were fortunate to also to be able to have uh, um, interventions from other authors, including Elizabeth Berger and uh, Eugene Reed. Uh, the panel was based on the ideas in the large collection of writings from across the world, from Palestine to Pakistan, Ireland to USA, Latin America, Africa and beyond, about how a new generation are discovering their mission of humanizing the world by claiming uh, Fanon as a thinker of our times. Why Fanon? Why now? Well, for the Richard of the Earth, conditions, as has been pointed out by many in this series, have not improved since Fanon's time, and in many cases have worsened. Reason and revolt are inescapable, the authors argue, quite simply, because as Fanon wrote, it has become impossible for them to breathe in more than one sense of the word. We're really indebted uh, to each and every one of the presenters during this series on the struggle of African peoples for freedom and emancipation. Uh, it has been such a rich uh, and um, valuable uh, uh, set of presentations. And I'm aware that I'm, I am not doing uh, sufficient justice to the richness and wisdom that they uh, provided us. Um, but I'd like to make a, a special thank to Professor Jade and Kinchi and the amazing group of interpreters and all those involved in organizing uh, this series. A, a great reflection, as I said, of Afro-Asian unity. And a special thanks, a very special thanks to the thousands of participants who joined from Billy Billy, the Chinese social network, and who, 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 whose questions uh, were, were just so um, uh, interesting and thoughtful. Uh, so uh, I look forward to everyone um, being part of, uh, uh, of our next series of talks, which we will, uh, which Michael uh, near Cosmos will introduce shortly. So thank you. Thank you very much, Vilos. And now uh, we would like to invite um, Michael to uh, present your great book on African thinkers. Thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I have entitled my talk, uh, which is in a sense is a proposal for, a, for, a, for the next course, um, the thought of politics in Africa from ancient times to the present. Um, and uh, it, it, I think we have to start by saying um, that it seems to us, uh, by which I mean both Firoz and myself, that it has become absolutely imperative to affirm the importance of African political thought in world history. Um, and it's in the intention of this course to contribute to this affirmation. In other words, we're interested in talking not just simply about what, uh, how people resisted uh, and how they got involved in the politics of their country, but their various countries, 
but also how they thought this and how they were able to very frequently write about it. Um, and up to this very day, it has unfortunately been the case um, that, and it's been something of a truism, that in fact, uh, uh, Africa, for a whole number of reasons, is said to be without history. And Africans have not meant to, or have been said not to have been involved in history at all. Um, and without wishing to go back to Hegel, it's important to note that uh, very recently, an ex-president of France, namely Mr. Sarkozy, made the notoriously racist comment in a speech in Dakar in 2007, quote, the drama of Africa consists in the fact <clears throat> that African man did not sufficiently enter, enter history, end of quote. So, um, the view is still pervasive that somehow Africans have uh, excluded themselves um, from history and have not had a history and um, nothing they have done or said is worthwhile really talking about. Um, so the vision of an ahistorical Africa has asserted and not simply implied the absence of collective political agency on the continent and consequently the absence of a thought of politics itself. Um, uh, what in fact, uh, the existence of superlative ancient civilizations, most notably that of Egypt, has been recognized as central to world history. But at the same time, it has arguably been de-Africanized by somehow attaching it to ancient Mesopotamia and Greece, whitening its inhabitants and enclosing it with most of North Africa within a category of the Middle East. So the effacing or distorting of, Af of human history through a colonial and racist white politics of whiteness that began broadly in 1492 uh, with the European Renaissance and its attendant colonial adventures, um, came to dominate with, uh, with the Atlantic slave trade and absented the history of Africa from world history. So at the same time, the existence of Africans as people, in other words, as political agents or makers of history, their own, as well as that of the world as a whole, was effaced, was simply rubbed out. And broadly speaking, the idea of African agency was only rediscovered by intellectuals in the middle of the 20th century during the struggles for independence. But it was not, with some exceptions, westernized African intellectuals themselves who were, in the main, the motive force of that history. As Amilcar Cabral has put it in a famous statement, one had to look elsewhere because it is the popular masses who are, quote, the bearers of culture. They are themselves its source, and at the same time, the only entity truly capable of preserving and creating this culture of making history. In other words, the popular masses were seen as making history, but they were not involved in much of the literature uh, and much of the thought regarding um, that making in uh, nationalist historiography. And this su suggests that the people of the continent themselves were capable of political thought founded with, within and upon African cultures. And the contributions of intellectuals due to their cultural assimilation into Western modes of thought tended to be uh, of a slightly different nature. If we look closely, political thought, the thinking of politics, along with the various practices which have sustained it, has in Africa been concerned both with an analysis of the state and its power, and with the collective thinking of people who in one way or another have attempted to exercise a modicum of control over their lives, and hence who have frequently come into conflict with that state. In other words, political thought has been concerned with a core problem 
in the history of humanity itself. The making of a political community in which truth, justice, and mutual respect prevail. It should therefore not be surprising to discover that Africans have been thinking politically from the very beginning, from the most important revolutionary epoch in the history of humanity, the so-called Neolithic revolution, up to this very day. In Africa, this has meant that one encounters political thinking from the period of the great pharaonic civilization of Egypt onwards. Now, any course on African political thought, therefore, cannot avoid beginning all the way back from the Neolithic, which it should be recalled, was not simply concerned with the establishment of sedentary agriculture, but fundamentally with the consequent enabling of an emergence or of the emergence of a class or classes not directly engage in productive activity, who also had the leisure time to engage in intellectual pursuits and also with the development of a centralized state. Of course, the immensely productive character of the Nile Valley made these developments possible. Now, the emergence of the state in ancient, in ancient Egypt is usually said to have taken place between 3200 and 2686 BCE before current epoch. I hasten to add that this does not mean that the thought of politics is reducible to the state itself. Rather, we find that such thinking is faced from the very beginning with an intellectual confrontation with the question of justice in a context of state rule. In the absence of a state, societies find ways of ensuring that all transgressors of social norms are treated reasonably equally. This is no longer the case as a ruling class and state develop, for the social hierarchies of power make this egalitarian precept difficult to sustain. In Egypt, these conditions could only be provided by the universalizing idea, the use of, universalizing of the idea of mat, which basically referred to justice, truth, balance, and finally, ethical life, in the absence of which it was held by the Egyptians that society would descend into chaos. In other words, from its earliest inception, the thought of politics can be seen to not simply be concerned with the management and exercise of power, but also relations between power and the people it governed. Further, the idea of Mart presupposed a collective understanding of truth and more broadly of an ethical life that the Pharaoh was supposed to embody and defend. Moreover, it is interesting to note that its origins are generally agreed to have been African, to have emanated from Upper Egypt, so-called, or what is variously known in the literature as Nubia, or more archaically, the Kingdom of Kush or Ethiopia, which today broadly corresponds to the Sudan. The concept of Mart, and particularly the idea of justice as an ordering system, were so important in the ancient world that its effects have been argued to have stretched even beyond Egypt. For example, it is said to have had a profound influence on Plato's idea of the state. In any case, the idea of Mart suggests that from its earliest manifestations, political thought in Africa has insisted on an understanding of universal humanity as central to the thought of freedom. This idea is expressed in different forms later in history. Moving forward in time, the influence of African thinkers from the north of the continent on Western thought, who have usually been subsumed under the rubric of Islamic philosophers, for example, people like Ibn Rushd and Ibn Khaldun, these people also made seminal contributions to world intellectual thought by providing some of the earliest critical commentaries on the ancient Greek classics from the 12th to the 18th centuries. Thereafter, popular resistance to oppression in the form of slavery gave rise to a number of important contributions to the thought of the human on the continent, as well as ultimately in the Americas. In some then, African thinkers from the very beginning of human history 
didn't only write to make sense of their own world, but in so doing were highly influential in different ways throughout history for their statements were frequently of universal significance. It can therefore be maintained without hesitation that they have contributed to political theory in the most general sense of the term and not only to thinking their own continent and their own societies. Earlier examples of texts that have addressed African thought in general have usually failed to include texts outside the nationalist paradigm and are focused on male politicians and academics as the exclusive producers of thought. They therefore contributed to, a, they therefore contributed to an elitist patriarchal conception of politics. Ordinary people who had contributed so much to liberating the continent were largely effaced from thinking that process. The production of political thought was in some seen as an exclusively top-down process. At the same time, the hegemonic periodization of African history in terms of the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial divides to which, it, to which it largely adhered, contributed to seeing Western colonialism as the core of African history. So thousands of years of African history were simply incorporated into one period, the pre-colonial. Now this proposed course makes an explicit attempt to move beyond this traditional periodization, yet nationalist narratives are still important. In fact, an attempt has been made to distinguish between different subjective sequences of thought in different sections. In simple terms, this means that the issues, concerns, and questions posed and ways of dealing with them or resolving them are broadly of the same order in each sequence. For example, religious discourse is central to the literature in a certain sequence. Tradition predominates in another. Popular freedom predominates in yet another. The nation state in yet another. At the same time, and in contrast to earlier visions, we are trying to ensure that popular political expressions are also included as are important statements by women thinkers. In this context, it is also important to recall that political thought and statements do not exclusively take the form of academic papers or political speeches. Various idioms have been mobilized historically in order to express political thought. Poetry, as well as religious idioms, have featured particularly prominently in this regard. This is not only because religious idioms say have been expressed by millenarian movements, for example, but also because poetic verses can be mobilized to good political effects within particular conditions. This is particularly the case as various African traditions possess a culture or poetic political expression. I'm thinking here particularly of Somalia, for example. Now, of course, it should be clear that political thinking whose origins can be traced to Africa abound, particularly among the African diaspora in the Americas. And finally, in preparing this course, what became apparent was the extraordinary breadth and depth of political thought from Africa. And we hope that this modest effort will stimulate readers and students to explore the subject further. Now, the selection of topics uh, we hope will be guided by a number of criteria which are deemed to be essential. Firstly, we have tried in the course to include topics from all over the continent with as wide a geographical, historical, and cultural spread as possible. This is particularly important. Um, and we have been guided by the writtenness of thinking uh, that becomes apparent as soon as one makes an effort to search for material and areas for discussion. It thus can no longer be maintained that African texts of political theory are non-existent. That was always an excuse for racist ignorance anyway. In following this path, um, we have gone back in written history as far as possible. Now, secondly, and for reasons already provided, we have made a conscious attempt to include pronouncements by the powerful and the not so powerful. 
This is crucially important for popular voices have regularly been silenced or effaced in academia, yet can be shown to have contributed immensely to the thought of freedom. Academics, both ancient and modern, fill the pages of political discourse, yet we have not restricted the course to academics, critical or otherwise. We have tried to include people from all walks of life. Needless to say, we have not ignored important academic debates. Thirdly, we have made an effort to include important women authors. Given the well-known fact of patriarchal dominance on the continent and what Nawal El Sadawi has called the hidden face of Eve, it was imperative to attempt to redress the balance. We have included poetic statements when these seemed important, but whereas, men, whereas men's voices are audible, women's voices are sometimes harder to unearth not least because in most instances, politics has been historically the preserve of men. Unlike say in Japanese literature where women's comments on court politics are available, such narratives are not so apparent in African cultures. Fourth, as we have included authors from all way, walks of life, it has been crucial to discuss texts which are not necessarily written in idioms but would usually be classified as political. We know from historical research in the Indian subcontinent, for example, that many nationalist narratives took the form of epic poems and were expressed in religious idioms. We are proposing to include a discussion of several here, and these along with some poetic words, works for which there is a long tradition in African societies, as they have provided an understanding of popular concerns, which academic writings have often missed. Fifth, some political thinkers, for example, Franz Fanon and Amirkal Cabral, raised different questions regarding politics in Africa, which may necessitate detailed examination. Moreover, these writers' participation in popular anti-colonial struggles makes them cru crucially important witnesses of actual struggles, an experience which informed their thinking. We may therefore have to spend several sessions on them. Finally, we also propose to include a number of texts written by African thinkers which do not concern exclusively African problems. We have, done, we have done this in order to insist on the fact that Africans have made contributions to the thinking of politics in general. So it is proposed to, dis, to divide the course into seven historical delimited sections or parts which constitute distinct subjective sequences. These are already being shown um, to you. Um, there are seven, uh, seven in total. Um, the periodization goes as follows. The first section um, basically deals with state thought and popular thought in ancient civilizations, roughly between 3000 BCE and the 13th century in, of the current epoch. Um, the second uh, section deals with classical African scholars of political thought, in other words, um, uh, uh, what are usually referred to as scholars, African scholars writing in Arabic. Thirdly, the third section deals with um, uh, Africans, Africans, sorry, thinking against slavery and thinking against colonialism, the early, early expressions of nationalist sentiments in the 17th, from the 17th to the 20th century. Section four deals with the most more well-known um, examples of African nationalist thought and popular struggles from the 1950s to the 1980s. Section five um, deals with post-independence nation building and state building, um, particularly important um, on the continent uh, in the post-independence period. The um, sixth um, section deals with analyzing and debating post-colonial states and society. In other words, how various writers um, uh, uh, 
attempt analyzed um, and discussed the nature of the post-colonial state and society of the African continent. And finally, the seventh section um, uh, deals with the neo-colony, um, intellectual and popular uh, narratives and uh, um, debates regarding um, the neo-colony from the 1980s to the present. So these sections or parts propose a distinct and original historical periodization. And each of these, it is proposed that each of these parts will begin with an introduction, drawing attention to the importance of the texts um, being discussed. Each introduction will comprise a sort section or further reading that draws attention to other texts of relevance, particularly from those countries that may otherwise have not featured in the main body of the course. And we hope that as a result of this, um, this course, there will be less of an excuse for maintaining that Africans have not been the creators of both their own history and that of the world as a whole, and consequently of universal political thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we collect a lot of uh, questions. So um, now I may uh, type it in the chat room. Yes, um, let me uh, read one by one. Okay. Uh, what are possibilities of economic solidarity and integration for Africa to enhance Africa's self-sufficiency and autonomy where there are concrete experiment in Pan-Africanism that addressed the economic issues. Um, question two, since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have started to pay a lot of attention to health issues and to revisit the history of how traditional medicine fighting pandemic. I wonder how Africa deals with health issues and crisis crisis, not crisis, such as uh, AIDS, malaria, and COVID-19, do you still use uh, traditional medicine? It seems that many big pharma uh, earns a lot of money in Africa. And um, two more, let me type it now. The number three uh, is for Professor New Cosmos. Could you elaborate more about the idea uh, of Ma Maat? Yeah, if I'm not wrong. Oh. Yeah. Mm. And a uh, question for, yeah, is still for uh, Professor New Cosmos. In China, we now talk about ecological civilization. Was there important agroecological thought in Africa? with the uh, new music revolution that would be relevant for challenging modern develop uh, 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 developmentalism. And um, I think, yeah, this, this yeah, maybe um, uh, we would like to invite two speakers to respond first, and then let's see, we have uh, the second round of uh, Q&A. As far as I know, uh, there, are, there have not been uh, concrete experiments in Pan-Africanism. There have been regional attempts to, uh, to do so. Um, and, um, but, but I think, uh, the whole debate about um, the extent to which uh, African society or African countries are, are intimately uh, integrated into the uh, the dominated world economy, um, and and there has been, I think, insufficient debate around issues that Samir Amin tried to raise, and that is, what does delinking mean? What is the process? in which that happens. Um, and, and I fear that, 
a very personal view, but I, I fear that our elites are now so much part of the, the, the uh, transnational capitalist class that they, they don't feel the need to experiment or, or think further on this. And I, and I think that is where the tragedy uh, lies. They have a vested interest in remaining within the integrated international economy rather than try to create um, some level of self-sufficiency and autonomy. Um, but we are in a period of, of, of massive crisis, I think, happening in the, uh, um, in the US and Europe. I think there's a, a, there are potential openings, um, especially the discussions that are going on around the possible um, uh, break up of the unipolarity. So there are potential opportunities, but I think there's an awful lot of work uh, yet to be done on that. I think on question two, on the outbreak of, of, of various uh, pandemics, um, there, there's a lot of research, a lot of interest uh, uh, being uh, in, in terms of traditional medicine um, across the continent. And certainly the institute I worked at, at uh, the Kenya Medical Research Institute many years ago, uh, there's a vibrant uh, discussions about that. I'm not sure that that goes much beyond uh, mere uh, um, uh, research and documentation. I've not seen evidence of large scale epidemiological trials. I've not seen really, um, uh, and that's again, partly to do with the fact that big pharma dominates uh, the, the health field. And, uh, uh, and I think our elites often tend to um, benefit uh, directly from facilitating uh, the, um, the presence of big pharma. So I'll, I'll just le leave it at that point here. Michael, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, the Egyptian idea of Mart, um, which is Usually it can be spelt in different ways, but um, the way I spell it and the way I've seen it spelt is M A apostrophe A T. Um, fundamentally, the Egyptians believed that um, that everything, including humans, animals, uh, plants, were the create have a, had a divine. Uh, uh, nature. They were all the creation, they all came out of the same substance. Um, and that therefore it was absolutely crucial to maintain um, uh, balance, the balance of the world, both the living world and the afterworld um, when people were dead. Um, and in particular in the living world, the the belief system was surrounded this idea of Mart, which fundamentally um, uh, held that uh, people should be tre treated with justice. In other words, everybody should be treated the same. Um, and that truth was absolutely um, uh, central. Um, to, to this treating of everyone the same and to people's living. And that therefore there had to be an ethical life um, which, which would provide the necessary balance for society to be able to continue and not to collapse into chaos. Um, the Pharaoh being uh, uh, the son of God was responsible, apparently, for maintaining Mat. Uh, but unfortunately, there's historical evidence that the pharaohs didn't always do so. Um, and uh, as a result, um, uh, there were, uh, in one is instance, a rebellion that is quite well known. And um, uh, uh, examples of a complaint about why are you not why are you not adhering to Marx? Why aren't you treating everyone the same? But it's a crucial problem because clearly uh, ancient Egypt was not an egalitarian society. 
And um, given that some people were more powerful than others, not everyone was treated the same. And that as a result, it was sometimes difficult um, to argue that in fact, um, uh, that in fact, uh, uh, justice uh, in, the, in the sense of everyone being treated the same, the universal justice uh, existed at all times. Nevertheless, there was arguably systematic attempts to ensure that it was. So that's basically the idea, uh, including the contradiction. But what's important is that people wrote about it um, or got scribes to write about it. Um, and therefore these discussions around these issues did take place. The idea of um, ecological civilization, uh, uh, was, was there any idea in the Neolithic, um, Neolithic, Neolithic thought regarding, for example, um, uh, people's relations to nature, uh, relationship to nature? Well, clearly ancient societies um, uh, had a, a much more, uh, had a close, had an understanding of the necessity of um, not contradicting nature in any fundamental way. But what's important, what might be said to be very important about ancient Egypt was the invasion of uh, mathematics. Um, uh, although probably they weren't, they weren't the sole inventors of mathematics. Um, and their, and their uh, uh, attempts to understand both the planets as they saw them and the movement of the planets in the sky, um, the, the, the centrality of the sun, uh, which is pretty obvious in their religious beliefs, and their attempts to predict, in a sense, the flooding of the Nile and when there might be problems regarding uh, um, the, their agricultural pursuits. Um, of course, you may or may not know that uh, um, they were so sophisticated that they built um, some of the amazing structures in a particular way. Um, so at particular times of the year, whether it, I forget what it is, whether it is the winter solstice or the summer solstice, one can see particular alignments um, um, in, in their, in their um, architectural structures. So, um, I don't, I'm not, not an expert on uh, um, ancient Egypt, but it seems to me one can find um, texts which talk about this at some length. Mathematicians have discussed their Egyptian mathematics. And, and of course, um, uh, and there probably are a number of texts which deal with um, uh, their importance of their beliefs in the natural environment and their closeness to nature. Hope that helps. We still have uh, several questions, so I will read it out uh, one by one. Uh, question uh, five, in the book edited by uh, Professor Neil Cosmos, there is a title, The Peasant's Tale from Old Times. I'm yes. in the uh, rural reconstruction movement in China. I'm curious about what it is. Yeah. And uh, question six would be, um, uh, are Fanon's idea popular with the young people in Africa? If yes, uh, which aspects? Um, question seven, no? uh, how have the ideas of the Zapatistas, Rajava, communes in Venezuela, uh, Kerala, or uh, rural reconstruction in China being received in Africa? Now, the peasant's tale is, is fascinating uh, because um, here we have um, um, uh, a tale, a, a story, which was um, um, written down by scribes at the time, I'm trying to find out the date. What time? Where, where is it? I haven't found it. Let me see if I can find the date when it was supposed to, when it's supposed to go back to. Um, uh, all right. Yes. Um, three thousand. Three three thousand, which dates to to, to three thousand years before our current epoch. 
And what this what this the story is about is about um, a, a peasant who goes to market to sell his products and is cheated on his way by a government official who steals all his products and um, whips him. Um, and the peasant goes and um, complains to um, one of the, 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 the chief administrators in the area um, who he happens to know and makes, I think, nine different uh, appeals to, um, to this uh, 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 um, high official um, regarding the fact that he has been cheated. And this is precisely the argument I was referring to earlier um, saying that his, his, his fundamental argument is saying um, that the, the, the state is supposed to, or the powerful, um, are supposed to ensure justice. And in fact, this is not happening. Because here I am being cheated by a, a, a bureaucrat, a minor bureaucrat, um, uh, while the judges um, and um, the world around us is collapsing. So in, he, 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 he actually makes reference to the fact that there's a crisis in Egyptian society, that people can't walk out at night because they're afraid of being robbed, that they're getting uh, um, uh, cheated by judges, um, that people are stealing their produce and that therefore the society um, and the powerful are not adhering to the idea of Marx. So it's extremely, it's, it's, it's a fascinating text because here we have someone from really from the lower classes actually contesting the power of the powerful or people from the higher classes and saying that you are not adhering to your own ideas of what is just. So we have therefore a central uh, a text um, of politics of what I was talking about, the relationship between ordinary people and the power of the state. And that's what this text is about. And I hope we have some, the opportunity to discuss it. Um, uh, are Fanon's ideas popular? I don't know. I think that's probably a question for Nigel Gibson. But I think that for, that, that what I can say is that Fanon is being read a lot in South Africa. Um, I don't know about necessarily about the rest of the continent. And I know that, for example, Abahlali Basem Jondolo, um, and we heard um, a, a talk by Asbuzi Kode. I know that Abahlali are particularly keen um, on reading Fanon and discussing their and discussing his arguments and his ideas together. Um, uh, as to which I, which of his, uh, which of specific ideas he's particularly, they are particularly interested in, I can't really say for sure. Um, I don't know if Feroz has got any anything to say well, on I mean, this. I think, I, I, I think that there's a there is a wide consciousness about Fanon in many parts yeah. of Africa, and especially in North Africa, I think there's a a resonance there in, in uh, Algeria, Tunisia, uh, to some extent Morocco that I know of. Um, I, I, I think one of the difficulties that people have is, is that although Wretched of the Earth is, is, is such a complex, covers so many, so many issues, it's not actually the easiest book to read. And I think uh, the work of uh, James Yaki Sales, which uh, to say, uh, Lossier spoke about and wrote about in the chapter on Fanon is a really important one because it, it, he actually attempts to try and show how to read uh, uh, Fanon's Wretched of the Earth in a way that actually allows you to understand the warp and the woof of the different arguments that uh, Fanon makes. So I think that is a, is a, is a, is a, is a challenge. And so people will take certain chapters and work on it and, and there is a tendency in the, in the 
public media to, to characterize Fanon as merely uh, somebody who, who is into violence and, you know, complete misreading of, uh, of that. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in perhaps experimenting on using the, the, the techniques that uh, uh, Yaki Sells developed in prison um, and, and which he wrote about uh, meditations on Fanon's uh, Wretched of the Earth. Uh, really, really very interesting uh, uh, book. Um, but Nigel, um, perhaps you could uh, you could join us at this point and, and, and give us some sense from of, of your perspectives on all of this. Yeah, uh, thank you for Rose. I mean, it, it's a great question because um, Fanon is always being rediscovered. Um, the issue, of course, when you know when we talk about discovering Fanon, is um, how do people get access to the books? Um, it, they're quite expensive in terms of, uh, you know, outside of outside of academic circles. So a lot of people are reading, a lot of young people reading Fanon uh, in Africa are connected uh, with the academies rather than, for example, uh, what Michael said in terms of uh, uh, the Shack Dwellers movement. Um, but Fanon has always had uh, an African audience. Um, and one can see that also in in the book uh, that that we that we published that Feroz made available to you, Fanon today. Um, and and so, what are the topics? For example, um, the topic from Kenya is using Fanon's description of the um, of the of the city, the colonial city, the kind of bifurcated um, Manichaean sense in which there is on one hand you know, the, 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 the European sector, and on the other hand, um, the quote unquote native sector. And, and that is a concept that continues to be um, discovered and thought through in, in, the, contempor in, you know, in, in the in the contemporary situation. And that's what the author from, from Kenya talks about uh, in, in, in her article. There's also um, the ways in which, you know, Feroz, Feroz mentioned uh, Algeria the rediscovery of, of Fanon uh, in Algeria. And of course, the importance of Fanon in South Africa and the, uh, for example, in the book, uh, the discussion with shack dwellers who certainly don't have, who has, may have access to a PDF of the book, but certainly don't have a, a hard copy of the book. But um, I was there in 2020 and, and distributed um, some pages from the, from the conclusion uh, of 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 the wretched of 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 La Dame de la Terre, the wretched of the earth, uh, and we discussed them, and and there was a resonance uh, in terms of thinking about what Fanon is saying and thinking about it as as Faro says, reading it very slowly together in groups. It's not in an it's not in a seminar room, but in fact, groups of people thinking. Uh, uh, about what Fanon is arguing and thinking about, well, how does this help us understand our present situation? Uh, and that's what uh, the shack dwellers are doing uh, in their school, which they've called uh, the France Fanon School. Other elements of Fanon that have always been important uh, to, the African, um, to, to, the, to the African reader has been his analysis uh, of what he calls the pitfalls or misadventures of national consciousness. This was taken up in Kenya uh, in the in the in the six in the in the in the sixties uh, and nineteen seventies, for example, by uh, the 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 Kenyan writer uh, Ngugi Wa Tiongo, but also by um, Alamin Mazrui and so forth, writing about questions of what Fanon says about language. Of course, uh, Ngugi, Ngugi talks about that, but also um, the critique of the failures, and this is what Fanon does very powerfully uh, in that chapter, the failures of, of the new elites, the failures of the nationalist elites. And this is straight after independence. And of course, we're, we're, living, we're still living through that. Um, we're still living through that, 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 that sequence, that moment of, of those failures. So when I, was in, when, I, when I was in South Africa, um, in um, the first time I, I went to South Africa in the early 2000s, uh, I gave a lecture um, uh, on, on Fanon and students came up and they'd been reading 
they'd been reading the Wretched of the Earth. The young students, these weren't uh, graduate students, these were young students um, at, the, at the University of Durban, Westville. And uh, they'd been reading the Wretched of the Earth. And what they had done is as they were reading uh, a page of Fanon, they had changed the names um, of the party leaders or inserted the names of party leaders of certain of, of certain attitudes among uh, uh, nationalist leaders who just wanted to accumulate property and so forth and 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 become part of the conveyor belt of neo-colonialism and they basically completely applied it um so it's in so even for the first time reader of fanon there's always something to find uh, in fanon and there's there's um it's not just the sense in um the more complicated sense of of what to do but the first thing using his analysis to understand to understand and, and generalize your own situations that i think finds new readers uh, in each generation yeah uh, we would like to invite uh, gustav to um to say something because uh, he typed uh, his magic his message in the chat room. So, uh, Gustav, could you like to speak? Just, uh, I, it remind me in uh, 2012 in Dakar, in Africities, in the meeting of the African mayors, there, there was a delegation of the Chinese municipalities with the president of the Chinese municipality, and he declared to the African mayors, you know, the use of the world is in Africa, and you know you know this because in China we have less use. The raw materials are in Africa. We know that the dynamics and the economic and social dynamics are very high in Africa, provided that the Africans give themselves institutions that guarantee their independence. I think it was really. Very active. Thank you very much, Gustav. Yes, and and um, because uh, we do the live streaming on Billy Billy, and now we have over one one thousand and two hundred, and mm -hmm. um, three hundred one thousand uh over one thousand three hundred viewers, and you know that um, many of them are uh, young people. So we are very um proud to say that uh, the youth are. Uh, in China and also in Africa. And uh, we hope uh, through this uh, program, uh, we can um, build building a long-term friendship between uh, the young people in uh, both areas. So, um, and uh, Philos, could you also respond to those questions? Well, those, I mean, I think yeah. there, there's an important one, uh, question eight, how have the ideas of Zapatistas, Royava, commune in Venezuela, Kerala, and rural reconstruction in China have been received in Africa. But my sense is that, that, that among some, there's some awareness of that, but I, I don't think that the, the, the real issues that, that emerge in these situations about self-determination, about popular democratization of experiments in, in, uh, in, in organizing and self-governance in that sense i hate that word government but 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 it is about self-determination that i think uh, uh these are things that we ought to pay more attention to i don't know who posed that question but but i i would certainly be interested in bringing together uh both perhaps a seminar series but also uh a, perhaps a small book that allows that sharing of uh, of information, um, and 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 uh, so I'm I'm open to to suggestions from people uh, about uh, about those um, uh, those connections. We certainly have uh, a, um, a a conversation going on with one author uh, who has spent time in Rojava, uh, and and she is um, uh, planning to put together. Uh, well, in fact, she has written a book in Spanish, and we are looking at uh, finding a means for uh, translating uh, that into English and making it more widely available. I should mention that most of our books 
are available for free download as PDFs from our website. So the issue of cost uh, is, is um, uh, not, not necessary, uh, something that would inhibit it. Uh, but I would very much like to, 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 to see further discussions on, on that. Um, yes, um, there's a, a, a question about the point about Brazil. There's a growing interest in African political thinking. Uh, Fanon is being uh, read in some academic groups as well as Cabral and other African thinkers. Uh, it's important for you, us, uh, professor, who are working at the university to have access to updated books and articles. And I think that raises this whole issue about making uh, books <coughs> available. Um, uh, Kinchi uh, has, has um, asked me to say something about uh, the Raja Press. Um, I guess this is the commercial break, you know. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, uh, we're a small, small publisher. Uh, we've published about 70 or so books and have got about 20 um, uh, or so more in the pipeline. Um, and, and most of them are focused on uh, the, 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 um, the struggles that are going on uh, um, in uh, across the world, but especially what's now referred to as uh, the, the the global uh, south. There's also, as you let me uh, just share the the screen here. Um, that might give you some idea um, of uh, the kind of uh, books that we are publishing. Uh, recently, we published a. a um, a little pamphlet by uh, uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, which is taken from her much larger book on settler colonialism. Um, and as you'll see, there's a variety of different topics that we have, have covered. Um, Michael Neocosmos brought together uh, a, a book on, on, uh, on um, the politics and culture and African emancipatory thoughts, which has a, a, a essay by Anoka Cabral and uh, Wamba Diawamba. Um, we've published a series of uh, uh, books on the Kenya liberation struggles, uh, including um, uh, a, a new edition of uh, Mau Mau from when, within uh, the story of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, and, and as well as publishing um, uh, collection of three essays from or three interviews with uh, uh, militants from the Kenya uh, um, Land and Freedom Army. Uh, Fanon today, which um, Nigel's uh, edited and spoken about uh, more recently, material on Palestine, um, materials on uprisings. Um, and our policy here is, is we produce more pamphlets as well because young people seem to have uh, often a difficulty beginning the process of learning to read more, more extensively. And so we produce shorter uh, um, pamphlets which help people um, get into and discover debates. We also publish uh, novels and, uh, and po poems. Uh, this one here, Love After Babel and other, other poems, uh, was, was awarded uh, a, a, a it received an award from the Caribbean uh, Philosophical uh, Association. We publish uh, theoretical stuff uh, on dialectics of revolution, um, and we are about to publish uh, a book on, on uh, Herbert Marcuse and his uh, revolutionary ecological uh, thinking. Um, it, it's, uh, as I said, we're a small press. Uh, we've uh, um, are trying to, 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 to see books not so much as, as, um, as commodities, but as, as a, a means for sharing ideas, a means for engaging uh, in, in struggles. We've also done um, many uh, uh, podcasts uh, over the last couple of years, I think about 120, uh, podcast on various topics, but they were originally started around the, the issue of um, uh, of uh, 
um, the, uh, COVID and how militants on the ground across the world have been uh, dealing with that. For some reason, I'm not able to, to see the page. Uh, it's a, a slow connection, I suspect here. We're still on donkey net here in this little town that we live in. Um, so anyway, that gives you some idea of, of um, the, the kind of work that uh, Daraja at Beth plays. And we, we hope to be able to um, uh, publish many, many more. Uh, and um, I think some of the ideas that people have expressed here uh, are, are ones that I think we, we, we ought to um, uh, uh, explore further. Um, the website is, it's, it's there, uh, and you can see the, uh, our, our, our blogs, our, our um, podcasts, as well as the range of books, including our forthcoming uh, titles. Um, Thank you. The press is, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, Beatrice, do you also want to say something? Just, uh, just to say what I mentioned in the chat, that there is a growing interest in Brazil and Latin America, of course, uh, in the African uh, political and not only political thinking, but thinking in general literature, as well as Asian. Uh, I think the uh, Latin Americans are nowadays trying to reinterpret their own history because we have to to manage to go out of this track we are in for for a long time and therefore uh, it's uh, most important for latin americans uh, or for at least we a lot of us think like that to understand our reality through our own eyes and through the african experience and the asian experience and not anymore through the a European and North way of thinking because there, there are no answers for our challenges. So in this sense, uh, I also would like to congratulate you, Jade and Kinshi and all the speakers who are being um, discussing these uh, topics which are so important for us. Thank you very much. I'm speaking from Rio de Janeiro. I'm professor at the Federal University of uh, Rio in Africa, in, in um, political science. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Beatrice. I mean, I, I, I think it, it is interesting that, that Brazil is very important because, because you know, more than 80% of the slaves who were captured, people who were captured and enslaved were actually ended up in, 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 in that region. Uh, and, and one of the striking things I found was uh, I was invited, when I was in Kenya, I was invited to come to a, a conference uh, about uh, the African diaspora in, 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 uh, organized by Brazilians. And when I arrived there and got talking to people, I, they said to me, it's very nice to have somebody from the African diaspora. And what they talked about the African diaspora was the African continent, <laughs> whereas we talk about the African diaspora as being uh, outside the African continent. So I think it's a really interesting uh, perspective. They, 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 they see them as a huge, you know, more than half the population is of African origin, that they see themselves as African and, 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 uh, and, and those who are left behind in on the continent as the diaspora so it was a real education for me <laughs> okay thank you very much and uh we finished the uh, first series of uh african peoples uh fighting for uh, liberation but uh we will have the second series about the african thinkers so uh, now we are organizing and also have a good plan with uh, philos and also um michael so we are so glad we will have the second series. And meanwhile, we also um, to have a great plan to um, produce the um, uh, translation project. That means we will uh, translate a lot of books in Chinese and to provide an alternative perspective 
on uh, how to read uh, the world. And of, of course, uh, it's a, pe a pro-people or a people-centered per perspective. So thank you very much. And um, we will meet again. Thank you.